Good morning. Welcome back to High School Algebra 1 for MCPSS. For those of you that did not tune in with us last week, my name is David Dye. I am currently in my third year of teaching at Alma Branton High School, uh, where I am spending my second year there. And currently, this spring semester, I am t teaching uh, algebraic connections and discrete math. So for those of you that were with us last week, um, we focused on critical standard number one. And so today, we're going to continue focusing our attention on this critical standard, where last week we spent a lot of time thinking about factoring quadratic trinomials. And we're going to take a look at the rest of this standard today. So my focus is going to be centered around the questions that I posed at the end of last week's lesson. So question number one, thinking about why it's important that we looked at quadratic equations, um, specifically why they're set equal to zero. Then thinking about can we solve these equations, uh, specifically in standard form, if they were not equal to zero. But we're going to take a look at a couple other uh, variations on quadratic equation forms today. And then lastly, what are the different strategies for solving quadratic equations? So thinking about these three questions, my learning goal today for you is you're going to look for and make sense of the structure of quadratic equations. So we want to look at a bunch of different forms, try and look for patterns, and then make sense of those things as we look for efficient ways for finding solutions to each of those. Okay, so thinking about structure and then thinking about efficient strategies, the theme that I want us thinking about is how structure determines strategy. So that's going to be the focus that I want um, our attention to be towards as we look through um, these lessons. So. We're going to revisit some prior knowledge. I'm going to try and activate some things to help you uh, get comfortable with where we're headed. We're going to look for patterns and structure, as I mentioned in the learning goal. And then we're going to connect those structures to strategies that you should be familiar with. And then we're going to explore this question of why zero, making sense of that kind of necessary component. And then we'll summarize the lesson and then look ahead to next week. So as we think about revisiting prior knowledge, I want you thinking about what processes would you use to find the solutions to the following equations? The first one being x minus 3 is equal to 5. The second, 2 times the quantity x minus 3 is equal to 10. And then the third equation, 2 times the quantity x minus 5 is equal to x plus 3. So I want you focus, focusing on the process. How are you going to find solutions to these and then think about are you using the same process each time? And if not, how did your strategy change? So I'm going to step over to the whiteboard, and we're going to work through these three equations really quick. Taking a look at the first one, we've got x minus 3 is equal to 5. And so the solution here is going to be x is equal to 8, where we perform this inverse operation of adding 3 to both sides. And I'm using this language specifically, so I want you to pay attention to uh, some of the phrasing. Second, we've got 2 times the quantity, x minus 3, is equal to 10. And as we look to solve this one, again, we're performing these inverse operations, dividing both sides by 2, leaving us with x minus 3 is equal to 5. And then as I add 3 to both sides again, we have that solution is x is equal to 8. So thinking about the process, I performed an inverse operation here. I performed inverse operations here. And then going into that last equation, 2 times the quantity x plus 5 is equal to, I'm sorry, x minus 5 is equal to x plus 3. So if we were to solve this to find that value of x so that this is true, I'm going to distribute this 2. So we have 2x minus 10 is equal to x plus 3. We're going to combine some like terms. So I'm going to subtract x from both sides, leaving us with x minus 10 is equal to 3. And then a last operation where I'm adding 10 to both sides. So x here is equal to 13. And I want to focus again our attention to these last two questions. Did we use the same process each time? And if I'm to summarize, that answer would be yes. I'm performing inverse operations each time. So in terms of that process, it stayed the same. So my strategy, trying to isolate the variable, didn't change. And I want you thinking about that as we look at this next one. So 
Again, I want you looking for patterns in the structure of these equations. So we looked at these three, and I want you thinking about the process you would use to find the solutions to this equation. Two times the quantity, x minus three squared, minus eight is equal to zero. So think about how this particular equation is different from the, from the ones before, and is the strategy here similar to what we did previously? If we were to work this equation out, would you follow the same type of process to find that solution? So looking at two times the quantity x minus three squared, minus eight is equal to zero. Again, I'm gonna perform an inverse operation here leaving us with two times x minus three squared is equal to eight. I'm gonna divide both sides by two, leaving us with x minus three squared is equal to four. And then the inverse operation here for this squared term is gonna be the square root. So if I take the square root of both sides, we're left with x minus three is equal to positive or negative two. And that's gonna be something that's real key for what we're exploring here with quadratics. So I'm gonna set up two different parts. X minus three is equal to positive two. X minus three is equal to negative two. And so our solutions are X is equal to five and X is equal to one. But again, I want you thinking about whether or not this process, the strategy that we employed, is it the same as the previous one, and I would say yes. Again, we're focusing our attention in this idea of using inverse operations. And with this equation, that strategy didn't change. Does it change if we use this equation? Instead of having it set equal to zero, what if it was set equal to 10? Does our strategy change? So, if I have this set equal to 10, our process, again, is still looking to perform these inverse operations, leaving us with two times the quantity x minus three squared is equal to 18. I'm gonna divide both sides by two, leaving us with x minus three squared is equal to nine. Again, we're gonna take the square root of both sides leaving us with x minus three is equal to positive or negative three. And our solutions as x is equal to six or zero. But again, the idea is structure. And here I've got this equation set equal to zero. This equation that's identical on the left-hand side, yet it's set equal to 10 on the right-hand side. But our strategy, using inverse operations to find the solutions, did not change from the previous set of equations. So, patterns and structure in terms of how these things are organized is gonna be important. Now, thinking about this next equation, would the process we use here be the same or different than what we've done on the previous two slides? I'm looking at this equation. The quantity x plus three times the quantity x plus five is equal to zero. And if you were with us last week, this should look fairly familiar. Right here we're talking about factored form. And so are we gonna use inverse operations to find the solutions to this or are we gonna use a different strategy? And if you were with us last week, the answer to that question is gonna be we're gonna employ a different strategy, specifically using the idea of the zero product property. So if I've got this quantity, x plus three, times this quantity, x plus five is equal to zero. I would set these two parts equal to zero, and then we would have two solutions where x is equal to negative three and x is equal to negative five. So let's talk about the structure really quick. If I'm looking at this equation where I've got these two parts, these two quantities. It's not anything like what we've seen in the previous two slides. The structure here is different. 
I'm looking at two linear terms, the product between them, versus on the previous slide I had one linear term, and if I went back to um, the slide, I think two slides ago, we're looking at all three linear equations. So the fact that I'm looking at a product between two linear terms changed my approach. It affected the strategy that we were going to use. Here I'm breaking these two, using the zero product property to find these two solutions. Okay, so here we have different structures that have affected the different strategies we're going to employ. Looking at a third different type of form. Okay, again, I want you paying attention to the process. So here we're looking at 2x squared plus 15x plus 7 is equal to 0. If we think back to last week in terms of strategies that we can employ, this particular equation isn't easily accessible to solve using inverse operations. So we're going to have to use that area model that we talked about last week. And with that area model, our 2x squared term is going to go in the upper left-hand corner. Our positive 7 is going to go in the bottom right. The product between those, so 2 times 7, a times c is equal to 14. So we're looking for pairs of factors of 14, whose sum is going to be our middle term, 15. So 1 and 14 is that pair, which means 1x and 14x are going to fill in the spaces in our area model. If I'm looking for the greatest common factor within this first column, that's going to be a 2x. The greatest common factor in this column is a positive 1. The greatest common factor along this first row is 1x. And then the greatest common factor along the bottom row is a positive 7. So now we have two factors, 2x plus 1 and 1x plus 7 is equal to 0. So we took this form, changed the structure of that form into something that's more accessible, and now we can find our solutions by setting each of these parts equal to 0. And our solutions here being negative 1 half and negative 7. But again, the focus is on the structure. How did that structure dictate the strategy? I'm looking at an equation in standard form that we defined last week that forced my hand in terms of using the area model to create something in factored form before I can find the solutions. So the thing that I want you again reminding yourself is how are these structures dictating the strategies that we're going to employ? So we talked about how that affected our different strategy. What I want you to consider now is how would your strategy change if it would change if we're looking at these two equations? So the quantity x plus 3 times the quantity x plus 5 is equal to 3. And then the quantity, or I'm sorry, the uh, equation 2x squared plus 15x plus 7 is equal to negative 3. Would our strategies change if I'm looking at these two forms? Because previously, if I'm comparing structure, I, were, I was able to solve these two when they were set equal to zero. But now when I'm setting them equal to something that is not zero, does that affect our strategy? How would it affect our strategy? Let's find out. So if I'm looking at that quantity, x plus 3 times x plus 5, not equal to zero, but instead set equal to this value of 3, How does my approach change? I can't just subtract this. I can't just set up these parts and say x plus 3 is equal to 3 and x plus 5 is equal to 3. That doesn't really work. That doesn't give me viable solutions because then x would be equal to 0. And if I plug 0 in, I get 15 is equal to 3. And that, that strategy right here is not going to work for us. So we're going to have to employ something different. I want to start by expanding these two terms. I'm going to multiply them and end up with x squared plus 8x plus 15 is equal to 3. 
And now we've got something that looks like this standard form, except I still have this 3 lingering over here. So I'm going to subtract and end up with x squared plus 8x plus 12 is now equal to 0. Now I have something in standard form set equal to 0 that allows me to solve for what I need. So if I'm thinking about this, I can factor it using that area model. And we would end up with the factors of x plus 6 times x plus 2 is equal to 0 for solutions of negative 6 or negative 2. But again, this structure, the fact that I'm no longer set equal to 0 and instead am set equal to 3 changed my approach. I couldn't use the zero product property because that doesn't work. That doesn't give me a viable solution. And so I expanded. I created something in standard form, specifically something in standard form set equal to zero that allows me to solve it. And if we were to look at that second one, the 2x squared plus 15x plus 7 is equal to negative 3. Here, if I had 2x squared plus 15x plus 10 is equal to 0, this doesn't factor either. And then we would have to employ the quadratic formula using x is equal to negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. And when I substitute those values in and find the solution, it's a very different strategy than what we had to do before when I could factor it. So as we continue to think about these structures, I want you to think of them as pairs of equations that we've looked at. So the first two, the 2 times the quantity x minus 3 squared minus 8 is equal to 0 or is equal to 10, what do they have in common? And what that is is that they've got this single linear expression, that x minus 3. So that single linear expression differentiates it from the other equation forms. And we're going to give this name as vertex form. So we're going to name this equation type as vertex form. Last week, we looked at these types of equation forms, where I'm looking at two linear expressions and the product between them as factored form. And then lastly, the pair of equations that we're looking at are both in standard form but the key difference here is that I'm looking at something that has a quadratic term, this x squared term, as well as this linear term, that 15x. And again, we're trying to make sense of the structure, whether it's a single linear expression, the product of two linear expressions, or a quadratic and linear term that helps us make sense of which strategies we can use. And when we're talking about strategies, the ones that are available to us, We've isolated the variable using inverse operations, where we have two solutions. We've used factoring techniques and the zero product property with the aid of our area model structure to find our two factors. And then we've arrived at a situation where if we can't factor it, we have the quadratic formula that we can employ to help us find our solutions. So now, if I'm thinking about these structures, do you use the same strategy for these equations set equal to 0 and these equations that are not set equal to 0? They look the exact same on the left-hand side, but that right-hand side really does make a difference in terms of the strategy that we can use. So what I'm going to show you next is going to be this kind of table that allows you to check off what kind of strategies you can use based on structure. So how does the structure we have determine the strategy we're going to use? And if I'm looking at this table, think about our different forms, vertex, factor, and standard, whether or not they're set equal to 0, and then our different strategies. So I've shown that we can use the inverse operations as we're talking about vertex form, whether it's set equal to 0 or not set equal to 0. Those strategies still work. If I'm looking at factored form equal to 0, that's pretty easy. I'm just going to use the zero product property and those factors and find the solution. But what happens if you have the factored form not equal to zero, like we have right here? 
the strategy doesn't really work anymore. And if you follow this work, we ended up with the standard form equation set equal to zero. So when we have the factored form set not equal to zero, we're going to convert it to standard form equal to zero, and then we're going to use this idea that now it's in standard form equal to zero if it's not prime, which means I have factors, then I can use my factoring techniques in the zero product property. But if it is prime and I can't factor it, then I have the quadratic formula that I can use. And then lastly, if I'm looking at a standard form equation set not equal to zero, I can set it equal to zero and then follow these ideas in standard form. Okay, so I want you paying really close attention as you're looking to solve these equations. How are you going to make sense of the structure? And then using that structure knowledge, how do you identify a strategy? So this table I think is useful. This flow chart here I think is even more useful. Again, when we're solving quadratic equations, we've got these three different forms. Within those three different forms, I can break them into set equal to zero or not equal to zero. And then from there, I can identify the appropriate solution strategy. But think about the ones that work and the ones that don't. If I'm set equal to zero in any of these forms, I have a solution strategy that I can use. But think about the factored form not equal to zero. Think about the standard form not equal to zero. I have to convert those into unusable forms, specifically the standard form equal to zero. And then from there, I have more methods that I can employ. So as we think about why zero is so important, I want you thinking about this particular equation. So we've got x squared plus 8x plus 15 is equal to zero. And here's the graph of that function this U-shaped graph. If I go back to that equation set equal to zero, and I want to solve it. To find the solutions that are going to make that equal to zero, I can factor it. I've got the quantity x plus 5 times x plus 3 set equal to zero. And so my solutions are x is equal to negative 5 or x is equal to negative 3. Well, how do those solutions connect back to the graph that we see? What relationships do they have? And the thing that I want you to notice is if I'm looking along this x-axis, those solutions, the negative 5 and the negative 3, that's where this graph crosses the x-axis. So the importance behind setting these graphs, I'm sorry, these equations equal to 0 is that it tells us exactly where our graph crosses the x-axis and gives us those x-intercepts. And this is going to be an idea that we continue to explore over the next two weeks. How do the equations illuminate information as it relates to the graph of the quadratic function? So summarizing some of the things that we talked about today around those three questions that I posed last week and opened with this morning. So why is it important that we looked at equations set equal to zero? Well, they give us the information about the graph of those functions as the x-intercepts. So the solutions there, when set equal to zero, are the x-intercepts of our quadratic function. Second question, can we solve quadratic equations that are not equal to zero? And the answer is yes, but also no. In certain forms we can, like in vertex form, when it's not set equal to zero, we can solve it. But we do need to do some manipulation when it's not set equal to zero for the other forms. And then once we have what we need, in terms of the form, we've got these different strategies that we can employ using inverse operations, whether we're factoring and using the zero product property or using the quadratic formula. So those are the ideas that we talked about today. Looking ahead for next week, some things that I want you thinking about. What is the general shape of quadratic functions? In what ways can we transform the graph of quadratic functions? And then what information about the graph of a quadratic function can be revealed in its equation. So as you think about that for next week, uh, we're going to wrap up, and I will see you all next Tuesday.